Lady Anne Neville was born at Warwick Castle on the 11th of June, 1456, the younger of the two daughters of Richard Neville and Anne Beecham, Earl and Countess of Warwick. Although the Neville lands, centred on Middleham in Yorkshire, would have to pass to Warwick's nearest male heir, Lady Anne, and her sister Isabel were still supremely eligible, being co-heiresses to vast estates including the earldoms of Warwick and Salisbury. By the time of Anne's birth, her father was already an ally of his uncle by marriage, the Duke of York, and before she was five years old, he had helped York's eldest son, Edward, to take the throne from the Lancastrian King Henry VI. The scant evidence that we have, suggests Lady Anne may have lived mainly with her mother and sister at Warwick Castle, though her first known public appearance was in York, at the enthronement feast of her uncle, Archbishop George Neville in 1465. Also at that feast, was the younger of Edward IV's two brothers, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who had recently joined Warwick's household. During the previous year, a rift had opened between Lady Anne's father and the king on account of Edward's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville. The new queen's possession of several unmarried sisters, deprived Warwick of most of the suitable matches for his daughters and the king may have granted him the keeping of Richard and the younger Francis. Lord Lovell. As prospective bridegrooms for Isabel and Anne, Warwick's ambition, however, was to marry his elder daughter to Richard's older brother, George, Duke of Clarence, and his younger daughter to Gloucester. There was nothing in canon law to prevent this, the only obstacle was the king, who wished to reserve George for a diplomatic match. Despite Edward's opposition, Warwick won George over and sent agents to Rome to secure the dispensation for his marriage, and probably also for Anne's marriage to Richard. But at that very time, relations between the king and the earl broke down completely, Richard chose to remain loyal to the king and left Warwick's household for good. As Francis Lovell had already been married off, Anne's marriage prospects must have looked rather bleak. Clarence's marriage to Isabel Neville in 1469 was the foundation stone of their joint rebellion, which destroyed the king's favourites, and temporarily consigned King Edward to custody and put the Nevilles back in control. After a brief reconciliation with Edward, and a further unsuccessful rebellion aimed at placing Clarence on the throne, in April 1470, Warwick and Clarence fled, stopping briefly at Warwick Castle. They collected Anne, her mother, and her sister to take with them into exile. Isabel's first baby was born dead aboard ship. Eventually, the fugitives found a haven at the French port of Hunfleur. Warwick and Clarence made their headquarters there whilst King Louis had the Countess and her daughters removed to the greater security of Valognes Castle south of Cherbourg. Leaving Clarence and their womenfolk behind, Warwick travelled on to the French court at Amboise to plead with Louis for military support to oust King Edward. But the king's prize was the restoration of Henry VI, and when the Earl returned to Normandy, it was in company with Henry's queen, Margaret of Anjou, and their son, Edward, Prince of Wales. To gain Warwick's support, Margaret had grudgingly consented to Anne's marriage to her son, but as Anne and Edward were first cousins, a dispensation was needed for their union to be lawful. And whilst Louis's messenger hurried towards Rome, Warwick had to return to England without seeing his daughter's wedding. Anne and her mother followed Queen Margaret to Amboise to await the dispensation, which probably reached them before the end of September. By the 19th of October, they were informed of Warwick's victory in England, yet throughout November, Queen Margaret contrived to delay the marriage, and it was not until the second half of December that the couple were finally married. Anne was 14, a very young woman who would later be described in model terms as seemly, amiable and beauteous. As soon as the couple married, the English party set off for home. They entered Paris to a royal reception and reached deep before the end of January, but the weather was so stormy that it was March before they set sail. They did not make land until the 14th of April, and that was only at Weymouth, many miles west of their probable destination. They had arrived just in time to witness the downfall of the new regime. King Edward had returned and taken London, Clarence had reverted to his Yorkist allegiance, 
and that very day Warwick had perished in defeat at Barnet, and travelled in the forced march to Tewkesbury, where King Edward's forces destroyed the Lancastrian army and Prince Edward was killed in the rout. Anne and her mother-in-law were found in a poor religious house and brought to Coventry, where the former Princess of Wales was placed in the keeping of her sister and her husband. Shortly after Edward IV's restoration in 1471, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, expressed his desire to marry Lady Anne Neville, daughter of the deceased Earl of Warwick and sister-in-law to his brother, George, Duke of Clarence. Anne, recently widowed by the death of the Lancastrian Prince Edward, was barely fifteen and, following her pardon by Edward IV, living with George and her sister, Isabel and also signified a portion of the Earl of Warwick's hefty estate. However, the entirety of her inheritance was in fact, for separate estates that spanned Warwick, his brother, John Neville, and his widow, and Beecham, Countess of Warwick. But that inheritance was complicated by the fact that Warwick had no sons, that his widow sought sanctuary at Beaulieu Abbey when she learned of his death, and he was guilty of treason. As such, there was every expectation that Parliament would pass an act of attainder against the Neville men and George, as Isabel's husband, would inherit the bulk of the riches. That didn't quite work for Edward IV, who had no desire to see his untrustworthy brother so rewarded. In Richard marrying Anne, the estates could be partitioned between the brothers. And if Richard amassed land holdings, then all the better for Edward, since Richard had proven himself time and again to be loyal. The other factor was the location of the lands themselves, Warwick and John Neville had held the north, a responsibility that Edward clearly didn't feel he could invest in George, nor the only recently loyal Percy family, restored to the earldom of Northumberland. Preparing Richard to take that place was thus strategic. Already Richard was being rewarded for his service during the events of 1470-1471. After his restoration, Edward made him Great Chamberlain of England, Steward of the Duchy of Lancaster beyond Trent, and Commissioner of Wales, Cornwall, and Chester while the infant Prince of Wales was a minor. This last honour is the most telling, already, Edward saw Richard as the natural guardian figure for his son but also not the only one. He shared the commission with Queen Elizabeth Woodville, George, Robert Stillington, Bishop of Bath and Wells, Anthony Woodville, the Earl Rivers, and William, Lord Hastings. Richard was also granted two estates that belonged to Warwick, Middleham and Sheriff Hutton. It's possible Richard personally desired them, Middleham in particular, was likely his home in the 1460s when he lived in Warwick's household. Either way, for Edward to properly grant them, he had to pass acts of attainder, which hadn't yet happened. George was likely none too pleased. It's unclear exactly when Richard approached Edward about marrying Anne, but he approached the Clarences, and perhaps Anne, in June when all were in London. What we know about Richard's relationship with Anne is annoyingly opaque, and as with much about Richard's life, the facts we do know can be viewed multiple ways. Ricardians point to Anne's uncertain position after her first marriage, and the fact that the two likely knew one another as children, while his detractors argue Richard married her for money. We do know that Richard and Anne knew one another by 1471. At the very least they met in 1465 when Richard attended the celebration of George Neville becoming the Archbishop of York. It's also entirely likely that the two to three years Richard spent in Warwick's household facilitated further interaction, but that's conjecture. As far as motivation, it is possible personal feelings were at play if they had spent time together. But even if not, it's worth underscoring that both had a pretty good motive for finding marriage to the other attractive. For Richard, Anne obviously represented a significant financial windfall, and for Anne, Richard was arguably the only man in England with the clout to take George on and preserve her portion of the Neville inheritance. A man of lesser status would have been bulldozed by the king's brother, while Anne's position was tenuous as a Lancastrian widow. Whatever the case, Richard left London shortly after making his intentions clear, and when he returned, George, 
who had already protested the match, told his brothers he had no idea where Anne was. A bizarre incident followed in which Anne was reportedly discovered living in the home of one of George's retainers disguised as a kitchen maid. She was later moved to sanctuary in St. Martin le Grand. The consensus, backed up by the Crownland Chronicle, is that Anne was placed in hiding against her will, but Richard's action to remove her from that household and place her in a convent, is open for debate. It depends on an unknowable, whether Anne wanted to marry Richard or not. Given that it's a safer bet to assume she didn't want George to keep her in financial limbo or force her into a convent full-time, Richard may have represented the lesser of two evils. Precisely when these events occurred is not known. Nor is it known quite when the marriage took place. The dispensation might have reached England as early as June, but the earliest extant reference to Anna's Duchess of Gloucester appears in a statute enrolled between late October 1472 and the 8th of April, 1473. As Matthew Lewis points out in his biography of Richard, the location of St. Martin Le Grand was respectable and a far cry from her being housed somewhere under Richard's direct authority. Even so, it's a bit of a guessing game. As for Edward, he was eager for his brothers to reach a compromise. The issue was debated by the brothers before council, in the winter of 1471-1472, and one anecdote from those meetings is that both argued their case well with a firm grasp of the law. The Crownland Chronicle goes so far as to say if the brothers joined forces, they would have been invincible. If only the brothers viewed themselves that way. In February 1472, George and Richard joined Edward at Sheen, during which time George apparently said that he didn't care whether Richard and Anne married, but that he was unwilling to compromise on the financial settlement. Richard went ahead and took his shot, he and Anne were married at some point between March and June 1472 at Westminster. So fast was the wedding, that Richard didn't secure the necessary papal dispensation, as he and Anne were first cousins once removed, Richard's mother was sister to Anne's grandfather, however, the marriage settlement was arranged so that if the marriage was dissolved on the grounds of consanguinity, he kept Anne's lands, and moved to Middleham, which essentially became the couple's base, but Richard stayed involved in the negotiations over the Neville estates. During this, the Countess of Warwick wrote from Beaulieu Abbey, asking that her portion of the inheritance be returned to her, per the law. She eventually left Beaulieu in 1473 and moved to Middleham under the escort of James Tyrell, one of Richard's men, however, it's highly debatable whether she went of her own volition. And if she did, there is some indication, mainly from later Tudor sources, that it may have been under false pretenses and Richard kept her under glorified house arrest. In other words, it's unclear what the personal dynamics of this arrangement were, but custody of the Countess certainly worked to Richard's financial benefit. In February 1473, an Act of Parliament was passed granting Richard his portion, the Neville, Montague, and Salisbury estates. In the end, George was left with the Beecham and Dispenser estates, as well as Warwick's London residence, that he was already using, and Richard's office as Great Chamberlain. In May 1474, an Act of Parliament stripped the Countess of her claim, declaring her legally dead. Negotiations continued for another nine months until February 1475, at which point everything was pretty much wrapped. But there was yet another layer of complexity to all of this. The Warwick portion of the estate awarded to Richard had in fact been entailed to the next Neville male kin, which was John Neville's son, George Neville. Neither John Neville nor Warwick were attained, thus George Neville should have been able to take possession of his inheritance. However, the reason why John Neville and Warwick weren't attainted is because George and Richard preferred to take possession of the estates through their wives, not as a gift from Edward. The estates of both and parents were treated as forfeit, and her mother's lodgings in Beaulieu Sanctuary were surrounded by a royal guard. The king granted the Neville lands in the north to his younger brother Richard, whilst the girl's own inheritance went to Clarence. The disgraced and was left with nothing, 
But in the middle of February 1472 Richard successfully requested the king's permission to marry her. Initially, George agreed to cooperate only if he could retain possession of both girls' entire inheritance, but after some persuasion, he conceded a parcel of manners and Richard and then sent off to Rome for a dispensation to cover the affinity that had arisen between them, because of Anne's marriage to Edward of Lancaster. One of the first tasks Richard undertook after his marriage was to obtain the Countess of Warwick's release into his own household at Middleham. She rode north in late May of 1473, and in no time, rumours were emanating from the royal household that Edward meant to restore all her property so that she could give it to the Gloucesters. These rumours may have unnerved Clarence as, when Richard returned to London for Parliament that autumn, he found his brother arming men to deal with him. According to news that found its way to the French court, George was also claiming that Richard had somehow married and by force, which would have invalidated the union. King Edward forced Clarence to submit his dispute with Richard to arbitration by the Royal Council. The Council's final award was that the Countess of Warwick's entire inheritance was to be divided between her daughters and their husbands as though she were dead. Should Richard and Anne be divorced, their marriage voided, Richard was to retain his interest in and share of the inheritance so long as he continued trying to effect a valid marriage with her, thus robbing Clarence of any further incentive to force an annulment. After the long Easter recess of 1474, the agreement was passed into law. Two months later, Richard and unsealed indentures with George and Isabel that rehearsed and agreed to all the terms of the act except those relating to the possibility of Richard and Anne being divorced. Clarence had managed to keep rather more than a half share of the estates, including both eldams, though Richard and Anne had acquired the Welsh lordship of Glamorgan. The new Duchess of Gloucester could finally settle into her new role, of which we catch occasional glimpses in the records and had more about her than simply good looks and nice manners. Their marriage helped Richard win the acceptance of Warwick's old retainers in the north, and for his part Richard never overlooked the fact that the lands of the 1470 for settlement had come to him in right of Anne, every deed relating to them being issued in joint names. Anne was a friend to Durham Priory, which rewarded her good deeds on their behalf with membership of their fraternity of St. Cuthbert and she communicated regularly with the prior on behalf of members of the ducal household. During the summer of 1475, when Richard was away in France, and appears to have stood in for him to some degree, as in that year, the York City Council made gifts to members of Richard's council who had come, bearing letters from the Lady Duchess of Gloucester. The couple's only child, Edward, seems to have been conceived on Richard's return from France and born at Middleham during the summer of 1476. In the autumn after Edward's birth, we find Richard purchasing furs and silks for Anne in London. In June 1477 Richard and Anne were admitted together to the Corpus Christi Guild of York and walked in its annual procession. In September 1478 they issued a charter in joint names confirming the liberties of Cardiff, capital of the Lordship of Glamorgan, and a year later they rode away to visit the Lordship together. A surviving fragment of financial accounts affords us a snapshot of their stay at Swansea Castle, during which a local tailor repaired seven gowns for Anne. It may have been on this journey that the couple endowed Great Malvern Priory with its great west window, in which Richard and Anne's arms are both incorporated. After Edward IV's death on the 9th of April, 1483, Richard rode south to take up his position as protector to the young Edward V. And followed once he seemed to be safely established in London and arrived in the capital shortly before the beginning of the political crisis that ended with Richard taking the throne. It was during this period that Clarence and Isabel's orphan son, Edward, Earl of Warwick, was delivered into Anne's care. Richard and Anne were crowned together on the 6th of July. Richard presented and with a set of scarlet gowns for her ladies to wear at the coronation ceremony, whilst Anne made Richard a present of a full-length gown of purple cloth of gold decorated with roses and garters for his use the following day. Shortly afterwards, the couple set out together on their first royal progress.
At Windsor they temporarily parted ways, and going by the direct road to Warwick whilst Richard pressed on westwards through Tewkesbury. After reaching Warwick, Richard spent another week there with them before they continued on their journey. As they rode northwards, Richard wrote to his herald in France asking him to purchase fine wines over there for himself and his queen and consort. At Pontefract the couple were joined by their seven-year-old son Edward. In York they received such a rapturous reception that Richard decided to reward the city by staging their Edward's investiture as Prince of Wales, a very grand occasion at which Richard and Anne wore their crowns. The accounts of King's Lynn show that as Queen, Anne acquired a lion, perhaps the same one that Edward IV had owned, and like Edward, sent it on tour to entertain the crowds. In the spring of 1484, she and Richard rode together to Queen's College, Cambridge which an endowed, with great rents, in thanks, the university decreed an annual mass for the happy state of, King Richard, and his dearest consort Anne. The couple then made for Nottingham where during April they received the disastrous and unexpected news of their son's death at Middleham. You might have seen the father and mother, almost out of their minds for a long time when faced with the sudden grief. The 1473 Act includes the following language. Also, it is ordained by the said Octorite, that if the said issue male of the body of the said John Neville, knight, begotten or coming, die without issue male of their bodies coming, living the said Duke, that then the same Duke to have and enjoy all the premises for the term of his life. According to Matthew Lewis, he explains that, this final statement was ostensibly designed to protect the Neville male heirs from any violent act of precaution on the part of Richard or George. It also gave lip service to the legal fact that the patrimony belonged, by right and inequity, to George Neville, the son of John Neville, because of the failure to attain his father. The effect of this measure was that Richard only retained the ability to pass on his lands while there were heirs male of the body of John Neville, Marquess of Montague. In 1483, this rested entirely on the shoulders of 12-year-old George Neville, Duke of Bedford. If George died without producing a male heir, Richard's interest in the Neville inheritance reverted to a life interest only. That would leave him with nothing to bequeath to any of his children and give the reversion of the estate to the crown. George's inheritance included the same clause, however, he was dead by 1483, but we will save his history for another time. Yet another provision worth discussing is one that grappled with the hypothetical of Richard and Anne's divorce and allowed Richard to keep the estates he held through their marriage even if he discarded her. Some historians, such as Michael Hicks, have argued this was directly tied to the fact that Richard hadn't secured the necessary papal dispensation required to marry, but that's open for debate. As a divorce never happened, it's difficult to sort out Richard's motivation, save that he clearly meant to account for every possible eventuality. So, what can we glean from all of this? Edward, George, and Richard worked out a deal that was wildly unfair to the Neville family, but because of that, they're all guilty. It's worth noting the unfairness of it stems from the fact that Warwick and John Neville weren't attainted and there were obviously grounds to do so. Arguably, this was just legal wrangling to reach the same end. The treatment of the Countess is particularly harsh, but that judgment also depends on how complicit you think she was in her husband's treason. Either way, she was powerless to advocate for herself, and had to make do with Richard's protection until his death. And again, how she was dealt with rests with all three brothers, but particularly Edward as king. The wrinkle in all this that I've never been able to make sense of, is why the brother's inheritance was made dependent on George Neville living. I've yet to stumble upon an explanation that clears that up for me, save the idea that Edward never expected to die so soon and whatever the second or third act of this plan never came to pass. There are a couple other related points to bring up. Toward the end of 1472, Richard had another run-in with a widow. Among his many gifts from Edward around this time were the lands of the attainted Earl of Oxford, a Lancastrian. Richard took it a step further and visited Oxford's mother, 
then living in a convent, and demanded she hand over all her property to him. He then moved her along his various properties, threatening not to release her until she did so. She eventually gave way, though her son would be avenged during Henry VII's reign. The tale certainly lends credence to Richard's ruthlessness, and the idea that he and his mother-in-law weren't warm and fuzzy. Richard Ennan produced only one child, Edward of Middleham. His date of birth is unknown, with some placing it as early as 1473 and others much later. I personally believe the evidence placing his birth in 1476 is the most compelling. He spent almost his entire life at Middleham. If there were other children who died in infancy, or unsuffered miscarriages, it went unrecorded. Richard had two illegitimate children, John and Catherine, when he married Anne, both of whom would join the couple's household. Their mothers is la unknown, as are their exact dates of birth, but both are believed to have been born prior to Richard's marriage. They were given the surname Plantagenet. The third point raises another interesting fact about Richard, for all that his financial wrangling paints a picture of ruthlessness, there's little indication that he was unfaithful during his marriage. That doesn't necessarily mean anything, as the 1470s wore on he spent most of his time up north, so indiscretions would have been easy enough to hide, but there's no evidence of further illegitimate children post-1472. And of all the issues that came up during Richard's reign, a plethora of women wasn't one of them. There are many conclusions to draw, but given that Richard was 19 when he married Anne and 22 when the final negotiations were settled, we can at least glean he was neither naive nor a fool, and died on the 16th of March, 1485, the same day that England experienced a great eclipse of the sun. She was just three months short of her 29th birthday. She was laid before the great altar in Westminster Abbey, with honours no less than befitted the burial of a queen. In their letter of condolence, the Venetian Senate encouraged Richard to take comfort in the knowledge that his queen had led so religious a life, and was so adorned with goodness, prudence, and excellent morality, as to leave a name immortal. Two weeks after her death, Richard called the mayor and citizens of London together to address rumours that he had hastened Anne's end to marry Elizabeth. Speaking in a loud and distinct voice, he showed his grief and displeasure aforesaid and said it never came into his thought or mind to marry in such manner wise, nor willing nor glad of the death of his queen, but as sorry and in heart as heavy as man might be. I truly believe that Richard and Anne loved each other. They appeared to have a strong bond to one another. I do not believe for a moment that Richard hastened Anne's death. I believe she passed from natural causes caused by a nasty virus from that era, which was exacerbated due to her extreme grief over the loss of their only child. What do you think? Please drop a comment or a question below. As always, I feel that history education should be accessible to anyone who wants to learn. Our video content is always free and available to everyone. Please don't forget to subscribe. This helps us to be able to share the learning with those who may not have access to tutors and schools. In the meantime, don't stop asking questions, and never stop learning.